Welcome to this final keynote in the context of your Yes 3D conference. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this event. Uh, my name is Martin Welke. I'm from Ghent University in Belgium, and my main specialization is in fact innovation in higher education. And a large part of our research and practical implications, they are related in fact to how we support learning in higher education, and especially related to the professional final career of students. In this talk, I want to, well, have a kind of reflection on what are we now, in fact, doing in the VR field, especially in terms of trying to explain why it works and how it works. And I want to show you that we really need a more comprehensive theory to, in fact, undertake research about VR. So the structure is quite easy. In fact, my first question is simply, where are we? Where are we as to VR implications and applications in education? And this will bring me, in fact, to a discussion about what do we need to get a nice theory to explain these, well, this potential of VR. And then I will come to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. So we all know what virtual reality is, or I hope so. Okay, so we see it as a real or simulated environment in which you as a perceiver or a student as a perceiver experiences presence, daily presences in these simulated or real environments. And where are we now when it comes to the impact of VR in the field? Well, you will see that in fact most studies, review studies, they stress positive news. And you see that, in fact, here you see an impact on student learning, positive, on 21st century skills, and so on. Okay. Uh, another study here from Wang and Fu. Uh, it's now, again, language learning, but now a broader focus on mobile learning technologies. You see, yes, okay, we see an impact on speaking, writing, vocabulary, pronunciation, and maybe we should also do more research about fields such as listening, reading, and grammar. Uh, Yes, it's positive, this news. But where are we? Uh, let's go back, for instance, to this 2006 publication of Chen. And also Chen said, well, it's an impressive learning tool. But we have three challenges. And the first challenge is, well, do we have appropriate theories or models that guides the design and development of virtual reality and next to study the impact? And, and how do we, in fact, explain that, that, that attributes, and we call them affordances of VR, how they are actually able to support learning? And the third one is we do all research with specific, well, for instance, university students to look at the impacts. But what about this big variety of learners, and especially learners uh, with different aptitudes? Well, today I will focus especially on these first two questions. Of course, questions that bring us to the big word, theory. Where are we? Well, when you look at many studies in the literature, you see rather general descriptions of theoretical fields. So, oh, we link VR to ubiquitous learning, to self-directed learning, to constructivism, to game-based learning. Well, this is very broad. Another example here is, in this study, we adopt an eclectic approach where we link, for instance, integrative Le Gaulle's orientation of Gagné to the constructivist paradigm of uh, Jonasson, and then next we link that to the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. Well, okay, I still don't understand why the specific VR works and how it works for specific outcomes. So we really need to rethink a little bit what is a theory. So when we have a good, effective theory, it helps us to explain and describe why and how, in this case, virtual reality has an impact, how it works. So we have to look at virtual reality and the outcomes. But in, in a way, it's more complex than this. So what does it mean to look at virtual reality? Well, then we look at its design and your specific choice for affordances and how these affordances invoke processes and mechanisms that next can explain certain outcomes. And let's make it a little bit more complex because 
you, you might only get outcomes if you also have a change in improvements or you cater for what we call mediating variables. Well, this is the structure of this talk. We will look at the different components of the theory and try to look at where are we now. So the starting point of our theory is this concept, affordances. And we know affordances was put forward as concept by Gibson, where he talked about, in fact, not really humans, but about animals. And an affordance is the, the things of an environment or of a tool that provides something. So it's the thing that is being provided. And key is that what is being provided will support certain actions of an organism. So a theory should look at or start from the specific choices of characteristics of VR affordances that are being addressed, invoked and supported. And already there, when we look at the literature, we see confusion. We see a confusion between the affordances, so what is provided, furnishes, offered, and actions being invoked. And for instance, this is a typical list of affordances being put forward in studies. You can replay, there is a 3D visualization, you can work together with other people. It's very realistic, it's authentic, it gives you a complex uh, work setting. It's multiple sensorial, you can touch things, you can move things, you can design things. It's very vivid, it's authentic, and so on. But you also find in the literature this list, and then you see these are in fact actions being invoked by the affordances. The feeling of agency in fact results of certain affordances. That, that's why maybe it's better to call these pedagogical affordances. This is already what you expect as a result from certain affordances. And for instance, haptic experiences, well, they depend on the extent you, in fact, can manipulate. And feeling safe can be well, related to a friendly environment. Uh, the collaboration or the communication is linked to that you have to interact with others in the environment. So this is the first big question. What affordances do you put forward? So what kind of actions do we expect that are being supported? Be explicit about this and take care because here in the study of Stefan and colleagues we see that we assume that these affordances of VR, the virtual reality, are a nice depiction or a nice mirroring of the real reality. Well often we seem to be over enthusiastic because it all depends on to what extent learners experience that the affordances fit their own living day life. So whether it fits their reality. So check this. Now let's focus now on this big second part in the theory, where we look at how do the affordances and actions in fact are described in terms of processes and mechanisms. What do they invoke here? So how affordances are related to actions and how, in fact, these actions result in processes and mechanisms, okay, they interact, that then can explain certain outcomes. Well, there's a wide variety of theories out there that focus on these questions, but not all studies are, are really clear about this linkage between affordances, actions, processes, and mechanisms. And for instance, here, Chow, he, he says, okay, our study is based on self-determination theory, and then they explain it very well, self-determination theory, but the link with the affordances and the actions, or they even use engagement theory, a, a very key concept in uh, virtual reality research, and then they explain engagement. But what I miss is the link between the affordances and these theories and mechanisms. How does it work? Uh, for instance, you have another one here uh, of Barrett. And Barrett refers, for instance, to immersion, interaction, and imagination theory. Okay, And, and there you see how in, in using PlayStations or the Oculus, you see an emphasis on multisensory interfaces, a level of interaction, uh, and therefore immersion. And this allows interrelation with a virtual world. Here you already see a first clear description of these things. 
And they also use these researchers, uh, the technology uh, acceptance model, the TAM model, in fact, to discuss acceptance and the motivation to use the environment. So they can already present how features of the environment, the affordances, lead to certain models, theories that can help explaining what is going on. This is what we need. Another one is, for instance, Makransky and Peterson, who are very detailed in the different theories they, they link to explain how the multimedia nature, how, in fact, especially the cognitive and the affective learning path are taken into account. So, for instance, the control value of theory of, of achievement emotions is used to, to, in fact, explain how the affective component invoked by the affordances can lead, in fact, to learning. So you get a clear definition of this link between affordances and the theories and the mechanisms. And they even depict this with a model. I'm addicted to models, that's quite clear. Okay, and here you see such a model with clearly at the end expected learning outcomes. And they even have an emphasis, by the way, on uh, mediating variables, motivation and self-efficacy. Okay, so in the literature, you very often find a large variety of theories being mentioned clusters, categories of theories, cognitive, motivational, emotional, social, affective, ecological systems theories, and then very specific theories. This is just a short list. But the key is, what is the link between this theory and the specific affordances that you did select in the design of your virtual, virtual reality learning environment? And very often this link is too weak. Let's move to the mediating variables. We already alluded a little bit to some of these mediating variables. Well, in this study here of Pellas, you see that they made a review of virtual reality applications in the higher education settings. And here you see the outcome variables and those marked in yellow, they emphasize such mediating variables. They say, okay, we expect increased motivation and engagement that next can lead knowledge to knowledge acquisition or well, we have an enhanced interaction and collaboration that will next lead to a higher performance so this is a clear delineation of studies that focus on this and you also see here in in the percentages in the last column that especially motivation and engagement are being considered as key in fact mediating variables they are even often studied completely independent that independent, uh, even without looking at knowledge acquisition or learning performance at the end. Now let's move to, to what I will call the most difficult parts. You have affordances, more often well-defined and selected, uh, with a clear definition of the actions they support, and then how these actions come together in a theory and a model. And next, is the link with specific outcomes. So we look at the link between processes, mechanisms, and affordances, and specific outcomes. And you will see it's difficult. For instance, you get very often a less clear linkage. For instance, Panagiotidis, he says that very often a specific pedagogical approach is not easily recognized. There's a sense that uh, there are benefits for here, for instance, language learning, but what has an impact on what is not clearly defined. Uh, for instance, here you see a strong emphasis on engagement theory. And here you see that they say the engagement is fostered because of the social network, the social collaboration that is invoked in the virtual reality, and that will lead to foreign language learning. Yeah, okay, okay, but, but, but how? What is the link with specific objectives or elements in the language learning in terms of vocabulary or discourse? Okay, we don't know. So it's a speculative linkage. linkage. And here you have another one that is already, in fact, more explicit, where you see that the affordances by giving guided discovery in the learning environment, the virtual reality, where in fact the, the learner also gets feedback, okay, uh, that this invokes more motivation, a stronger motivation and interest 
and this might then lead to well interests for learning so you see again the it's more explicit but again the specific definition of the learning outcome seems to be lacking hmm? here you have another one where you have a weak linkage uh, where social interaction is promoted and social interaction is then linked to uh, more select being selective and it's also linked to interacting with objects and it's embodied and then they say therefore you will better focus on foreign language concepts okay Okay, but you have to read a lot between the lines to understand the linkage, to, to understand the linkage between these processes, these mechanisms and the affordances, okay, and the expected outcomes. This brings me, in fact, to the end of this reflective talk that we all know, in a way, the question is no longer whether virtual reality has potential. Uh, for me, the key question is especially can we explain how it works? So we have to be clear about the affordances we put forward and we select. And we have to be clear about what actions result from the affordances and how they in fact lead to processes and mechanisms that we can interlink in a hypothetical way. So that's our theory about the process and mechanism. And then next, how they are related to an operational description of the outcomes. And I hope I, I, that I could show you that especially the last part is very challenging. Why does it have an impact on vocabulary? How is the vocabulary linked to specific mechanisms and processes? So the result, in fact, of a good reflection on a theory is that uh, we should get more evidence about what specific VR design features do or do not have a direct or an indirect impact on learning outcomes. And in that way, we can validate theories. And especially we will see that we will need new theories to especially explain this link between mechanisms, processes, and specific learning outcomes that can be obtained because of the specific affordances and actions promoted in virtual reality learning environments. I thank you for your attention.